now. Hello, everybody. This is NGO Soul and Strategy. I want to talk to you today about Charity Navigator. Charity Navigator is influential in amongst both U.S. domestic and international nonprofits. It is, in short, and we're going to talk much more about this, what I would call an intermediate nonprofit rating or evaluation agency that rates nonprofits at scale to help small donors, but also maybe we'll find out institutional donors to make more informed choices on who to donate to. It does this based on a methodology that has evolved a lot over the last 10 or so years and which is exactly what we're going to cover today. Some countries may well be considering replicating Charity Navigator, so that'll be interesting to talk about. And I am going to talk about all these things with Michael Thatcher, CEO of Charity Navigator. Navigator sorry. I have a tiny bit of a background with Charity Navigator myself. Under Michael's predecessor as CEO of Charity Navigator, I was part of an informal circle of advisors as a academic at that time. My students were amongst others part of a nationwide experiment where a new dimension towards um, measuring results of nonprofits at scale was being uh, better tested, if you will. And from time to time, I was one of the many voices invited to weigh in on how Charity Navigator might need to evolve. And later, under Michael's leadership, I joined the um, uh, Charity Navigators Nonprofits Leaders Council. And finally, Michael and I are also part, both part of the Leap of Reason Ambassadors Network, which is an invitation-based network of nonprofit leaders such as Michael, funders, government regulators, analysts like myself and academics who are all united in their desire to promote a stronger performance or outcome orientation in the nonprofit sector. That was a long introduction. So with that, welcome, Michael. Thank you, Tosca. I'm delighted to be here. It's This is going to be an exciting interview. And I know for a fact that a lot of people will be very interested in our conversation. A quick bio on Michael. He is, as I said, the president and CEO of Charity Navigator. He is also a board member of Giving Gap and of Keystone, Keystone Accountability, which I thought was interesting because Keystone is well known in the INGO community, which is um, our primary audience for this uh, podcast. And Michael, interesting enough, was also in his past the chief of technology for Asia, for the Middle East and for Africa at various stages for Microsoft. So Michael, basics first. For those of us, particularly outside North America, who don't know necessarily Charity Navigator, what is it? What does it measure? And why and how has it become pretty influential? Sure. So Charity Navigator is a free online resource for donors that provides information on the full set of legally registered uh, charities in the United States, so about 1.6 million organizations. And then within that whole set, which includes religious institutions, houses, you know, houses of worship, uh, nonprofit hospitals, every, every form of nonprofit, on what we would call a charity, and a, you know, let's say a working nonprofit, there we have ratings on about 200,000 of them. Mm -hmm. One of the core principles of Charity Navigator is we don't charge the donor and we don't charge the charity for to be evaluated. So it's a it's free to both sides of the equation. Yeah. We also have tools and resources such as um, content guiding guiding givers of, of all different um, primarily sort of introductory level materials and then point pointing to higher level materials. We will also let you actually facilitate a giving transaction through the site. So we have a giving basket. And then finally, um, in addition to the ratings, we provide curated lists. So when something something topical happens, um, for example, take the, the war in Ukraine right now. Mm. People want to do something about the, the effort there and the refugees, helping the refugees in Ukraine. That's not part of the normal philanthropy. Those the curated lists help them find organizations that are doing something in that regard. The last piece about what we do is we also have um, what we call an advisory system, 
which is when something um, something unfortunate happens within an organization, something illegal, either accused or confirmed wrongdoing, we make that information available to the donors at uh, three levels of alerts, sort of saying, you know, low, medium and high. Oh, OK, that that was good to be reminded of a couple of quick follow up questions. Um, what's how many users, uh, depending on how you measure that, do you have per year? And are those users on the donor side? Um, are they primarily small individual donors? Or are they also institutional donors that you know are using your rating system? Great question. And I think the answer is both. But Charity Navigators, our primary audience is the average American donor. Okay. And I think that's one really important point to make is we are we are a U.S. resource, right? Because we're we're working on when I mentioned the, the charities that we're rating, one of the basic parts of the rating is the tax forms that uh, all charities must file. So we have 11 million unique visitors. So that's just based on that's a web web analytic. It's it's the number of distinct individuals. So 11 million annually. And that number has been growing. It's grown. It's more than doubled in the last five years. So there's a continuing um, amount of um, traffic. The other thing is through the giving basket, we're also seeing, you know, the average gift through the giving baskets, about $100. So that's those are small donors. Mm -hmm. Yeah, indeed. It, institutional donors use us as a, we're, we're a very useful way of actually just seeing comparative data in a standard format. So the mm -hmm. way the ratings are presented, whether you use the rating or not, the information they're in, the you know, tax forms are, are difficult to look at. Yes. So if you're looking for just sort of key statistical information, we give that to you. You can take the rating or not, but you, you have this additional data, which I think is important. And you're suspecting that some institutional donors will do a kind of a pre-screening maybe of certain um, nonprofits or charities. And just for full information or disclosure, I actually used uh, Charity Navigator's Giving Basket just this morning. Oh. Uh, and it's not the first time I find it incredibly helpful as well as uh, efficient. Um, so let's go a little bit deeper then. Um, there is a little bit of an irony, as one of my colleagues um, pointed out to me not long ago, that evaluation, especially for outputs and outcomes, right, and reporting typically by most nonprofits are treated as overhead and also that funders are often treating it as such. Is there an irony in there in, in the sense that what Charity Navigator is trying to um, its mission. So, I guess the the irony is that um, I think it's a I think it, in my mind I think it's a misperception okay. because if you don't measure your performance, how do you how do you actually improve your performance? Mm -hmm. And if you think of something like um, I think something that we both feel strongly about constituent voice or the the use of yes. you know, measuring how what I'm my intervention or even what intervention to do by asking the people that are actually being served by it, mm -hmm. that, that takes time and effort, but it actually, at the end of the day, it improves program, program delivery. And if we're not improving program delivery on a, on a continuous basis, shame on us, right? So first of all, that's one piece. I think the other is, if you think about Charity Navigator, our, probably our biggest problem and the hardest thing for us to do is to get data from the nonprofits. And so what we're trying to do and how we're building our systems is actually reduce the friction there and make it as easy and as simple for organizations to get their information to us. When you say that, Michael, the hardest thing we have to do is get data from nonprofits. Tell me more. Well, we rate 200,000 organizations. That, that bigger number is based on the tax form. The ratings today look at four four areas of evaluation, and I and this is this will take a little bit of effort. Yeah, no, you need to. I was going to ask you. Please go. Yeah. <laughs> so we're looking at the basic information, which is essentially certain what we're calling accountability and finance. Mm -hmm. A couple financial measures, and it's a few transparency measures. Things like you know, do you is your website URL listed on your tax form. Can we find, can we find you? Can we reach you? Um, 
we're looking at culture and community as another core area. Culture and community is look today is looking at two things. One is the internal diversity, equity, and inclusion practices of that organization. Mm-hmm. And also the um, what we call how it's the constituent voice. It's the how we listen information. How we listen to the primary users of either the services or of let's say campaigning constituents more the beneficiaries so this is okay. this is data that we are currently licensing from candid or guide star by candid and that was uh part of there's there's a, an effort to get charities to report on how they listen to their constituent base or their the, the be, their beneficiaries they're serving and so it's not the it's not the response it's right it's not like a net promoter score it's more how do you do you actually do you listen Okay. Does that affect, do you use that information to modify your programs? And so this is more demonstrating a behavior by the charity. Yes. And so that for that, so for example, that data is collected by GuideStar by Candid. We have on the DEI practices, we have about 15,000. And on the constituent voice, it's, um, I think it's a little bit higher, but I don't remember the exact amount, but mm-hmm. 15,000 is not a 200,000, right? No. So what part of part of our effort and the reason and we're working on Candid with this is how do we get leaders and organizations to actually give us this information? Because back to your original question, it is perceived as overhead. Um, I think what we're trying to do and we're trying to incentivize the, the working charities to give us this data because we we are we're we're trying to change the narrative. The donors do care about it, and they're going to start. And we've now made it easier to search on an organization that actually has this information. Mm. So if um, I want to finish talking about the ratings, so we keep this sort of you know in cohesive chunks. Yeah. Um, the other the other element that we're looking at are leadership and adaptability practices. This is data that we collect. So again. Nonprofit leaders need to come onto our nonprofit portal. They have to fill out a questionnaire and, sub- and submit information on on um, on how they're leading their organizations. And it's very simple questions at this point. You know, do you, do you have a theory of change? Do you have what's your mission statement? You know, just looking for alignment between mission and program activities. Mm-hmm. The last area, which is the hardest, is impact and results. And this is looking at a cost per outcome approach to measuring uh, you are now looking at cost per outcome absolutely and we are we're doing this so in 2020 charity navigator acquired impact matters mm-hmm. which was a startup evaluator um, started by elijah goldberg and dean carlin yeah. and um integrated their work into into this platform of the you know the new rating system that we have and so now they're there, they're roughly 1,500, right? So you go from 1,500 to 200,000, there's a huge gap to close in there. Yeah, yeah. And one of the challenges is getting the data. The other is for us, it's around coming up with appropriate methodologies for each different program service area that would allow us to come up with a cost for outcome measure. And that's going to that's gonna take us time. You know, yeah. right now we have a little over... I think it's a little, it's between, it's about 30, between 30 and 40 program service areas that are covered, but we've got a long ways to go. And in in some cases, cost per outcome isn't going to be the appropriate means of measuring impact. Well, we'll we'll, we'll undoubtedly talk about that. Yeah, but it's an enormously um, meaningful change in methodology that that you've been leading and that I personally have really appreciated. Sure. Uh, following from from the sidelines, but also you know through the um, the nonprofit leaders, uh, consultative council, etc. Uh, quick follow up on it used to be the case, or at least let me let me correct it. I used to have the impression in an earlier version of Charity Navigator that the methodology that came before this, so that was more uh, focused on financial uh, metrics and uh, accountability eventually, um, was really modeled after service delivery, particularly human service sector delivery charities or nonprofits. And so since I worked with 
um, international NGOs for a long time, the question, two questions always came up. One is how well is this suited and are you adapting it for campaigning or advocacy organizations? And secondly is how well is this suited to international charities? So the, the way, so I'll, I'll talk about the former rating system. So we had the, um, which was just retired last month or, or, or integrated, fully integrated with the, yeah. with the Encompass rating system. And I can talk a little bit about how that, that whole process at, at some point, but I want to answer your question. The former system was, we would set up, it was primarily looking at uh, financial um, cost structures, right? Mm -hmm. And where the money was being spent. Also the, uh, let's say efficiencies of their fundraising, uh, liabilities to assets, and um, you know, and there was a stronger focus on program expense and the program expense ratio to to versus admin versus fundraising costs. And so one of the one of the big areas of contention around that was how much it focused on overhead ratio. Yeah, because four out of seven financial metrics were looking at overhead. So that's gone now, which is, I think, a good thing for all of us because yes, it's, it is. It's not entirely gone. There is still there's still a a program expense ratio that's looked at, but it's one of several metrics, and so it's it has a much lower impact on the score, and it's more of a really try to call out when there's um, significantly unusual behavior. Mm. It's also changed in the sense that it's no longer you would get more points if you had sort of a program expense ratio of, you know, you had 99 versus 99 versus 95. The one with 99 got about higher score. Now it's, it's a, it's um the threshold is 70% mm -hmm. and you don't get, you get 71 or you get 99, you get the same, you get the same number of points. We are not, we're not incentivizing you to do more than that. Yeah. Um, Within the previous rating system, we were looking at each service area, and that a service area could be advocacy. Okay. It could be um, making making grants to other, like regranting organizations. Granting on granting. Mm -hmm. It could be, and in each case, we were looking at the cost structures. So, for example, the over, you know the 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 two most wide widely spread examples would be food banks which have incredibly low overheads yeah and museums which have incredibly high overheads mm -hmm. we were we were not measuring them with the same measuring stick we were calibrating based on the on the program service type and so we had a fairly sophisticated system that we've just we've just merged and and moved over to using uh candids um philanthropy classification system so the pcs but it's it who you are matters right identity matters particularly in today's world we're very we're very focused on identity yeah. and so we've always been trying to calibrate our ability to do that as effectively or not you know that's highly highly debatable right where we strive to improve but we're we really want to know who you are before we start casting any kind of judgment Right. The last part of your question was around international charities. We've what's difficult is we look at because our data is based on the IRS tax forms. You could be an international charity that has a U.S. presence. If you have it, and and then it it be, at times we've actually stopped rating an organization mm -hmm. because so much of their operations were really international. And the data we were getting from their from their reports in the U.S. were really they were fundraising in the United States. They were doing yeah. all that work in Africa, for example, and that doesn't work. And so we just stop at that point. Once we become aware of it, we stop rating you. Oh, I did not know that last point. Yes, yeah. um, and and that then makes us bridge over nicely into. And I I I could imagine, Michael, that you're kind of tired of talking about this, but past controversies around Church Navigator in the past. And it's amazing, by the way, how long that perception mm. of Church Navigator being stuck in some past continues well beyond when it actually empirically has has changed. And you have changed a lot. Your methodology has changed a lot, in my view, definitely in the right direction. But 
as you know, there has been this big discussion about what's wrong with the overhead myth. So just to explain to our audiences outside the US, particularly, this is the idea that if you spend more than 25 to 30% on your overhead, so your administration, your facilities, your fundraising uh, um, and fund development costs, etc., there is something wrong with you, basically, and a donor should shy away from that. That, in short, is called the overhead myth. Um, and there was, for a long time, quite a bit of resentment um, towards Charity Navigator in some of the circles that I have been in. So I've been in plenty of rooms with CEOs where they would kind of grumble about Charity Navigator and saying they are incentivizing the wrong behaviors or they don't understand this because we're international or we're campaigning, etc. So there was the perception that Charity Navigator was reinforcing something that's not uh, helpful, the overhead myth. Tell us a little bit about how Charity Navigator internally came to uh, an understanding of, about how it needed to respond to that critique initially and how it eventually had to evolve. Sure. So I think this is probably a good way to also talk about the history of Charity Navigator. Mm -hmm. So a little over 20 years ago, the founders, it was the founder and his wife, they came into significant wealth and they started giving back. And they realized that there was no there was no single source of truth or any way to um, sort of differentiate between the significantly large number of organizations out there. They also invested some money in a charity that got caught in a scandal. There were a couple of scandals in the early 2000s that were pretty high profile. And needless to say, they'd supported one of those organizations. Yeah. So there was this feeling of outrage of, you know, my money's been, I've yeah. been, I've been robbed, right? Yeah. And so Pat Dugan created Charity Navigator a little bit in the spirit of uh, Morningstar in the, um, in the financial uh, markets to sort of just, just do some financial analysis. And the work was at the time, it really was based on just the tax forms. It was also, we were looking at uh, the largest, most popular charities in the United States. And it was a very simple, it was a, it was literally the financials, right? So it was, that's all we did. Then the IRS tax form changed, I want to say in 2011. And that's when the accountability and, uh, and transparency metrics were added to the system. So this was before I was at Charity Navigator, but there was already, there was, I would say, you know, we've had three CEOs in 20 years. The Trent Stamp, who was the first CEO, was really about just getting us known and getting it out there and did a really good job with the financial measures. Ken Berger, who came in afterwards, yeah. was already trying to move the dial, right? Oh, yes. Realizing, you know, financials are not everything. We added the accountability and, financial, and uh, transparency metrics. You then also had... Um, uh, Charity Navigator, GuideStar, and the Wise Giving Alliance in 2013. Do you realize it's the almost we're about the 10 year anniversary? Oh my God! Of yes. The Overhead Myth Letter, right? right. So, wow, that's 10 years. It is 10 years. In 2013, there was a letter sent to the donors of America saying, "Stop looking at overhead. It's not a good measure of um, of effectiveness." That happened, and then all then there was the realization but there isn't anything else to look at, right? In other words, it's not, go back to the data problem. I, you know, I was talking yeah. about, there wasn't significant reporting on outcomes or outputs or, or no. anything, right? 2014 comes around, a second letter gets sent out. This time it gets sent to the charities of the United States. And it's again, it's overhead myth letter part two, but directed at the nonprofits. Yeah. And it's basically saying, you've got to give us something else to, to, to show the donors, right? Yeah. We are the intermediaries, but you're not, you know, give us, give us some, some results data. Yeah. That was probably an unfair uh, question, right? At mm -hmm. least in my own experience. So I've been with Charity Navigator now seven years mm -hmm. and, and I came, I came to Charity Navigator for our first attempt at um, results reporting. And that you mentioned, you'd been a part of that effort with, with Ken Berger and, mm -hmm. As I was joining, and that was actually one of the things that brought me over, 
And then a little sidebar, it was also through Keystone Accountability that I became familiar with Charity Navigator because mm -hmm. I was living in Singapore and didn't know what Charity Navigator was. I was just intrigued by the uh, the possibility. Yeah. Um, I was also amused when I got here and realized that we were not loved by the sector, which was very familiar to the work I'd done at Microsoft, working with the free and open source software communities. And I was like, oh, I know this. I know this position. And, and so I also know how to how to work on building bridges with that, because I think ultimately we have we've been very strong in our position around overhead for many years. And then we started moving away from it. But until we actually produced a rating system that did move away from it, that emphasized something different. Yeah. No, no one was really listening to us. Or right? Nobody was really aware that you were already shifting. They're still not. Right. And I think that there's a long tail to. Um, Interesting. To, I, I remember there was a horrible statement that a former CEO at Microsoft made about Linux and, you know, and, you know, Linux is a cancer. That statement lasted Lived well on. a decade. Right. And that uh, and it Microsoft's a very, very open to open source software. But at the time, we never got beyond that statement. Yeah, and that's it, so interesting. I just need to go back for the sake of our audience to two basic things, Michael. One is, uh, you may have said it, and I'm, I apologize if you did, but I want our audience to be clear that, is it right, my, Michael, that Charity Navigator rates based only on 3,000 foot information, meaning on publicly available information about an individual nonprofit, right? The the, pub, the website, tell me if I'm wrong, mm -hmm. and what we call, and I also want to make sure that our audience outside the U.S. understands that when we talk about the IRS, we're talking about the, um, basically, let's, let's call it the, the, the department in the U.S. government for, uh, rev, for revenue, um, collecting revenue, um, and the form is called 990, which is a form that basically every charity above a certain minimum income level has to submit annually. That amongst others provides basic information on the biggest programs, what they are about and how much money goes to them amongst many other data points. Are those the two main information systems? And then of course, in the new methodology, you are explicitly inviting nonprofits to submit information across all the, the what Charity Navigator now calls beacons of for mm -hmm. for data is is that do I have that right or not? So the the basic accountability and finance information is coming from the tax forms, okay, and the public website. Even that information itself is self submitted, right? So the um, the charities are submitting the information. It goes to the U.S. government. There's an assumption that they're they won't be lying on those forms, and so right. but you know the the validation of that data is done by the by the government. We are collecting information that has been submitted to other third parties. So GuideStar by Candid. Yes. We're also collect directly collecting information from the charities ourselves. And technically that's that's may not be information that that's on their websites or that is no. Uh, and you know, and this is also an effort with Candid. We're trying to harmonize what we ask because there's a you know if you think of a one of the big efforts in in philanthropy right now is how do we reduce the load on charities regarding reporting overload mm -hmm. and so we don't want to be part of that problem which means no. we're we're working with our our counterparts or the what are we've been categorized as infomediaries mm -hmm. uh, which I like um, and then also I mean we're different than Candid because Candid doesn't doesn't score the charities. They provide seals of transparency based on how much data you give them. They're not actually evaluating that data. Right. We're, you know, we're doing the evaluation, so that makes us different. We're also we're also a part of. Um, there's an effort that was spearheaded by the MacArthur Foundation called the Philanthropy Data Commons. Mm. That has um, kind of a full spectrum ecosystem right now, but it's the it's the different grants. Um, services manager so the you know flux blackboard all of the, all of those it's the major foundations and then it's candid charity navigator and and some of the 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 infomediaries so to speak and it's um and it's looking at again how do we reduce the load on the charities and also yeah. 
how do we ensure that the data is owned by the charities and then they can they can actually allow us to reuse it in ways that is going to yeah. be equitable. yeah so it's 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 a more it's a yet more comprehensive data set than than what was uh front of my mind thank you for for correcting me on that a question that i also had is so typically who pays for generating the data that nonprofits need and who should pay in, in the data that nonprofits need in the sense of you know their their information on programs their reporting information needs that they need to submit basically at the end of the day the donors pay if you think about it and okay. one of the um, one of the incentives, so having a charity navigator rating is, it, at least in the United States, it's it's a it's a valued trust metric. You get a high rating with charity navigator. You can you can use that as part of your uh, promotional materials and all of your development work with individual donors and and even with foundations. I mean, if you have the you have the top rating, you're going to brag about the fact that you have oh, a top rating. Everybody does. Everybody does. So that's we're, that's part of the incentive that we're providing. Mm -hmm. um, you also have organizations, you have foundations that will not, and this I've seen, and I, I don't love this, and this is one of the motivators for me that um, where I realized we really have to expand our rating system, where I would hear someone say, you know, I won't give to an organization unless it has a charity navigator rating. And that- At all. Me at all, right? And that made me very uncomfortable because when, yeah. when I joined Charity Navigator, we were rating 8,000 charities. We're now rating 200,000. So I feel better about that. But I also know that there's still thousands of charities that we're not rating. Yeah. And if you're saying, I won't I won't look at them unless they're rated. Yeah. You know, so part of that, that is an incentive though, right? So if, if and it's not that hard to get a rating. It's not that hard to get, um, get your profile up with Candid. And- there are also barriers to entry. For example, you know, the um, uh, Amazon Smile, for example, the data to Amazon Smile, I think this is US specific, but it's a way of actually sort of pennies on the dollar or not even parts of pennies on the dollar um, go to your favorite charity that you can sign up for this on Amazon. But yeah, yeah. you've got to have a, you have to have a, you have to have a candid profile in order for you to actually be eligible for that. So I think, you know, nonprofit leaders want to be known. They want to be able to differentiate themselves. They also want to do their work. But yeah. but you've got we've all got to, we've all got to bring money in in some way or form. And yeah. so the, the evaluators and the infomediaries let you be known to a much broader audience. Yes. And that's yeah. the that's the incentive. All right. And by the way, I'm I'm one of your many, many small donors um, because I believe in a mission. And particularly since um, since you've expanded the, the methodology and made it much more comprehensive. Um, so would you say that generating the data on results and impact is also something that de facto is paid by by donors or in the case of charities that receive large institutional grants by taxpayers? So there's an interesting, um, there are a couple of organizations and, you know, when you look at, if you get a foundation grant, you can generally, you you plug in a certain amount for measurement and evaluation, right? And, uh, and, the, and the, the donor these pays. These days, foundation, yes. These days. So I know we, I know we carry a certain amount of the load for the overhead uh, situation, but so do the foundations and they've also changed right now. It's, um. And that's really, that's important. You also have, um, and this is interesting. So there's another organization, I don't know if you're familiar with them, the Impact Genome Project. Not really. And what they're doing is they're also looking at, it's more of a catalog of outcomes. And which is an interest. So in other words, they're trying to get donors to think about investing in outcomes mm -hmm. instead of investing in problems. Ah, it's a it's a different spin on things, and um, might be an interesting. Uh, Jason Saul is the founder of that. Uh, he's based in Chicago. Be an interesting person to talk to at some yes, point. Yes, definitely. What they do, and the way the way their their business is set up, is that they do the they do evaluation, but they have they work a lot with corporate CSR initiatives. So I'm you know company X Y Z. 
we have a portfolio of 20 organizations that we support on an annual basis. They pay Impact Genome Project to do a, um, an outcome analysis mm-hmm. and actually do the measurement. And so th- there again, the donor's paying mm. and they're paying the evaluator to come in and do the intervention for them. Interesting. So, Michael, uh, looking at the time as well, I want to ask you a couple more uh, questions about the the newer methodology. And again, you've just uh, integrated, as you say, the old system and the new system. The website has been updated, so people should definitely go there and have a look. Um, What have been the reactions so far? It's early days, but to your what I'll call updated and much more comprehensive methodology. I think there's... um... It's everything from a sigh of relief to delight um, and then uh, discontent because a lot of, so we've had, we've had a, we've been doing things a certain way for 20 years. Yeah. And so the, um, I would say, and the other thing to realize with our core audience is individual donors. The largest demographic group are uh, people over 60. Mm-hmm. And so the, um, there's less, um, less aptitude for change. And there is, you know, there is a lot of um, the people are upset. We, for example, we bury it. It's hard to find the overhead metric. Um, it's there, but you have to really look for it now. So it's we're doing a lot of um, we're trying to have you look at the metrics that we feel are more important and more conducive. More so that's, that is going to be behavior changing, but there is that transition point that's a little bit tricky. That is, um, yeah, and it's ironic. So you have now a counter push by people say, I want to actually continue to see the overhead numbers. Uh, the thing, you know, and this is an interesting tension point for us because, um, you know, Charity Navigator is also a charity. Yeah. And over 60% of our funding comes from individual donors with the average donation size being $45. So we get, we get, tens of thousands of those, you know, $45 donations. Right. Which means we have to be popular. Yes. But we're we're not, we're not a consumer. In other words, we're not just about making the donor happy. We're an evaluator. We're supposed to be guiding uh, giving. And so that means we may do things that people don't like. Yeah. That are right. And then you have to do that in a way that's actually digestible. Otherwise, in other words, we, we, we have to validate why we do what we do. And we have to make it easily consumable. And I think sometimes that's one of the challenges I've I've seen in the in the more erudite conversations about impact. Mm-hmm. That can be mind numbing for someone who is really yeah. wanting to make a difference around homelessness or education for a certain group of people. They don't need that much information. Right. And so we're trying to we're trying to simplify it, and, and we're also trying to we are a scale organization. So we are going to be at um we're going to be more of an entry point for someone on their philanthropic journey. That's so interesting. I'm glad I asked it. I did. I hear say Michael that um mo, uh, what did you say? Most of your the, your users are people sixty and up, or did I misunderstand that? So the largest um. We look at sort of when you look at your analytics. The largest, it's about thirty, a little over thirty percent of the um, of the users are over sixty. So that's the largest um, cohort Segment. by age. The second largest, which I and I love this fact, and we're we're trying to understand it better, is the twenty five to thirty five year olds. I was hoping you were going to say yeah. that. Yeah, yep. it would not be a good thing. So that is the second largest. Okay, that uh, mm-hmm. that puts. Uh, puts uh, me a little bit at at ease. How do you plan to continue to further scale the number that you can raise? Uh, Because you've gone up so tremendously already. There are a couple of ways. One, I think what's what's really important to us right now is that we fill out the beacons. And so, you know, I go from 200,000 with uh, accountability and finance and only 1,400 with impact and results. Mm. I want to close that gap. Um, I want to get more, so it's, it's increasing the, um, what I would call sort of the, the weight of the rate of, of each of the ratings. Our new website right now has a way of, that's going to help in this regard, because you're able to, we've done a lot of work on search so that you can search on cause area. You can search on 
uh, on rating. You can also search on number of beacons. And people generally gravitate to, you know, the, the spirit of more is better. Mm -hmm. And so if I have more beacons, you're also going to figure out you're going to you will land higher in the search algorithm if you've completed more beacons. So we're favoring we're, we're favoring the adoption of the, mm -hmm. of the ratings. So that's one area. The other is there's going to be the way we're doing the accountability and finance work right now. There's going to be a natural growth to that in that the IRS um, has mandated electronic filing. If we have three years of consecutive electronic filing, we automatically generate a rating. Yeah. So that's going to be, there's going to be, as that that law was, the, it would, went in, it technically went into effect during the, the, the COVID years. And so it was delayed in its enforcement, but it's now in, it's now in effect, I believe. And so within a, within a number of years, that's going to, that's going to continue. The last piece would be around internationalization. And I know that might be relevant. Yes, to that's actually where I wanted to <laughs> land before we say goodbye. So talk yeah. to me, please, about I've heard signals in the past that some other countries, maybe not all of the model, but wanted to mimic or adopt certain aspects. What's the status right now? Do other countries, have they adopted a form of charity navigator? Are they considering it? There's. I think you'll find more... Um, equivalencies of GuideStar. There's even, you know, there's even a GuideStar India that actually uses that name mm. and, um, where there are more data collectors, where you have the Charities Commission, which is actually government in the UK. Yes. And and so they're, they're similar, but different. I've had, you know, since I've joined um, periodically, and actually in the last month, I've had three conversations. One was an academic project as a thesis project by, by two young technologists at the um, uh, University out of Lisbon. They mm -hmm. were trying to, they were essentially building our website and setting it up for, for uh, EU focused. I also okay. am also talking to someone right now about the United Kingdom and wanting to do something there. The challenge, the challenge for us, and this is probably worth noting for, for your audience, we're a small organization. Yes, you are. You know, we've we've actually grown significantly, um, but we're we're still only thirty five people. Yeah, and and that means, and I don't really have staff that are trained in international issues. We also one of the reasons Charity Navigator has been what it is and it's achieved the success that it has is that the U.S tax authority and the way they've set things up mm. they require that the tax forms be open government documents so it's public information mm -hmm. there are not a lot of countries in the world that do that so having that um indisputable data source that's reported on you can love or hate the the irs form 990 but it has a, you have to file it the same way. Everybody files it the same way. Yeah. It's a de facto standard that we've been able to build a system off of. Yeah. You need to figure out the equivalencies in other countries just for your grounding information. Yeah. Other elements of our rating actually map quite, could, could work anywhere in the world. And we have a couple of internationals that have given us data and then we actually, you know, try to set up a profile for them. So there's this, you know, we would love to do this, but we'll probably end up doing it more in the sense of helping someone else do it. Well, yeah, and that's what I was uh, intending to ask. Not so much that chairs and navigator would go global, uh, yeah. <laughs> but more I was curious whether other countries are looking at this model in addition to probably having their own thinking. Um, and saying, what can we learn from chairs and navigator, particularly since you've had a real you've really evolved in the in the very interesting way. There's a real history here and a lot of learning, including some hard learning, right? But also look look where it's going now. Um, and I was simply curious whether other countries are um, uh, considering something that is somewhat uh, um, similar. So super interesting. Well, we are at time. So 
I had wanted to ask you one or two other questions such as around how the, the uh, US government's uh, 990 form with the IRS could be improved to provide better data on activities, but also but importantly about results, but that might get us too much into the weeds. So let us ask you the last question. If people want to learn more about you, Michael, and about Charity Navigator, including this, this, this journey, uh, that you've made, where should they go? So the simplest is just come to charitynavigator.org. And okay. on the website, you'll find sort of different, you have discovered charities, you have, you know, a whole bunch of information about us. We have a blog series, and we also have sort of what I would call almost like a breaking news area, sort of really what sort of key, key, key facts and figures about the organization. Mm -hmm. I'm happy to receive outreach as well. It's M. Thatcher at charitynavigator.org. Okay. And, um, you know, generally the, everything's on the website and that's one of the nice things we've integrated. We used to have a separate blog and all these different, you know, we also have social media presence, but go to the website. It's the easiest. You, that's where you, okay. We want our listeners to go. Well, it's been really fascinating. And I do want to applaud you, Michael, and the whole team for the road you've traveled. And I, I find it very encouraging. So thank you for all, all your insights and thank you listeners if you found this episode stimulating, then you might be interested also in uh, the chapter in our co-authored book Between Power and um, um, Irrelevance, the Future of Transnational NGOs that George Mitchell and Hans-Peter Schmitz and myself um, co-authored in 2020. We have a chapter on measurement where we also, amongst others, talk about the charity navigator factor in uh, in in how the behavior of nonprofits has evolved when it comes to evaluation uh, and being more outcome focused. If you don't own our book yet and want to just get a preview, you can access the concluding chapter for free by signing up for my email list at fiveoaksconsulting.org. And you can find this episode as well as many others also on my YouTube channel. Again, subscribe to our email list and you will always be the first to know, including when the next episode drops. So this is Tosca and I look forward to spending time with you next time on NGO Soul and Strategy. <laughs>